Hello and welcome back or welcome to the channel. I'm Loudguns and today we're going to be taking a look at a selection of ships that could be classed as daily drivers. The ship that would be top of your favourites list in the ASOP terminals if CIG thought that would be a useful feature. One of the coolest things about the game is there's unlikely to be a definitive answer, because the rule of cool is always going to weave its way into these discussions. And what I like might not be universal. But we're going to try and make this as objective as possible, setting a few criteria with which to grade different ships. So if this sounds good to you, then grab a cup of tea while I roll the intro, then let's get into it. So first and foremost, let's establish what makes a good daily driver. Essentially, we're talking about your most used ship, providing you with the capacity to travel the stars, move your stuff around, defend yourself, and carry out as much gameplay as possible. We're also going to consider value for money, but as ever for this channel, our primary focus is going to be on in-game currency. Right now, you can buy nearly all of the release ships in Star Citizen in the in-game ship shops for AUEC. And I generally recommend that you start with an entry level game pack, the Aurora or the Mustang are usually the most cost effective, and then make a ship from this list a priority purchase once you rack up some credits. If you are thinking of getting involved, just make sure you use a referral code when you create an account to get a little leg up. Mine's the one up on screen, but if a friend of yours is already playing then just ask them for theirs. Another thing I can heartily recommend is asking to borrow people ships to try them out. We're going to start with some of the cheaper options you might consider, but as we go through the list and more bells and whistles get added, we'll find that things do get quite pricey. So reaching out in global chat and asking for a test drive can be a really good option, or you can join into an SC community. The link to our Discord for example is just in the video description down below. But without further ado, we're going to take a look at each of the ships on this list. First up, we've got the Consolidated Outland Nomad. It will set you back just over 950k from New Deal at Lawville. Now there are some smaller options, things like the Cutter or the Pisces that some people suggested, but I really just drew the line at being able to carry a range of ground vehicles. The Nomad is Star Citizen's pickup truck, and while it doesn't have any internal cargo space, the flatbed at the back can take 24 SCU of cargo, and also has the ability to carry ground vehicles like both types of rock mining buggy or a cyclone for getting to and from bunkers. In terms of systems, the ship has three size 1 shields, which give you slightly less shield HP than a single size 2 would, however it does arguably offer more contingency. There's also a size 1 power plant, two size 1 coolers, and a size 1 QT drive. The Quantum Drive is one of the Nomad's key limitations versus other ships on this list, particularly in the current game. So at size 2, ships are capable of installing the military grade A XL1 drive, which will get you around Stanton fastest. To put it in perspective, the longest jump between two planets in Stanton, from Microtech to Artcorp, is going to take you about 8 minutes with a Voyage Drive, versus 4 minutes with an XL1. So in terms of saving time during your session, those long journeys can really add up and they can eat into your gaming time. But in terms of firepower, the Nomad packs 3 size 2 weapons, all on gimbals, so you could upsize these to size 3s if you're happier with fixed guns. Inside, the Nomad has a well-designed setup for a solo player, with suit storage and a tidy habitation area with bed and kitchen, before you head on through to the cockpit. So while the Nomad has some drawbacks compared to some of the others on our list, it's arguably one of the best designed for a lone wolf. The pilot seat has really good visibility, and the ship itself is really quite manoeuvrable for a multi-role ship, with a max pitch of 42, roll of 40, and a yaw of 148. It's the most manoeuvrable on this list, and the SCM speed of 180 meters per second and max speed of 1171 is amongst the fastest. But if you want something a bit punchier, then you might want to take a look at the Drake Cutlass Black. It will set you back just under 1.4 million credits from New Deal. The Cutty is the entry point into size 2 QT drives, allowing you to get that faster interplanetary travel in, cutting down your error in time quite significantly. 
Part size is scaled up across the board with a size 2 shield, size 2 power plant and two size 2 crawlers. As well as an increase to four size 3 hardpoints that come stock as size 2s on gimbals, there's also a man turret with two size 2s on top which gives a decent 360 degrees of fire. And the Cutty also has a fairly good payload of missiles packing eight size 3s and eight size 2s which is amongst the highest for its size. The ship's cargo bay gives you 46 SCU of carrying capacity, and it can fit a range of ground vehicles, although it is worth noting that the narrowness of the entry point combined with the folded up jump seats does limit you slightly, for instance meaning you can't fit a larger Rock DS like you can on the Nomad. In the forward portion you'll find the decidedly Drake living space, you've got a gun rack, a couple of bunk beds and no bathroom, and you'll also find access to the ship's turret here. Then up front is the cockpit with seats for the pilot and co-pilot. Visibility is a bit more restricted than the Nomads, but I still personally think it's okay, and the lower viewports can be quite useful for when you're doing stuff on planet and moon surfaces like rock mining. And the Cutty also benefits from VTOL, allowing you to rotate the large thrusters giving you a faster takeoff or more stability when hovering over a planet's surface. Compared with the Nomad, you are sacrificing manoeuvrability, with pitch and roll at 30 and yaw at 110, while SCM speed of 165 and max speed of 1114. But this is still pretty reasonable. As an added bonus, as of patch 322, the Cutlass's tractor beam is also now fully functional. You can get access to this a little bit cheaper using the Origin 315P, but I think when you take it into consideration alongside the Cutlass's fairly good cargo hold, this is the first point at which it's really independently useful. Alternatively, if you don't enjoy duct tape being one of your ship's stated construction materials, you might prefer a somewhat more robust option from MISC, the Freelancer, which will set you back just shy of 1.7 million from New Deal. If the Nomad is the space pickup, then I think the Freelancer is the space box truck. Compared with the Cutlass Black, you get a small component upgrade, you're still packing that size 2 power plant, two size 2 coolers and a size 2 QT drive. You do get an additional size 2 shield versus the one on the black. The guns are also scaled up with four gimbaled size 3s, although worth noting that in the case of the Freelancer the gimbals are hardwired in, so you can't choose to fix the weapons and go up to a size 4. However, there are notably fewer missiles on the base version. If you do love your explosives, then you might just want to check out the Freelancer miss variant though. The added protection is merited since you've got an enhanced cargo bay as well, with storage for 66 SU of goods. Although I will say that the long thin shape can make it a bit of a pain for fitting in ground vehicles, something that will inform my next ship for this list. The manned turret access is in the cargo bay, and again the defensive nature of the Freelancer series is on show here, with the field of fire being quite weak towards the front. So unlike in the Cutlass where the gunner can easily focus the same target as the pilot and add their DPS, the Freelancer's turret, which also has the same dual size 2 armament, is meant more for dissuading pursuers. I will also say that the turret access is currently a bit of a pain. You can sometimes end up in it when you're only meant to open the back ramp or vice versa, and the hanging elements can clip certain ground vehicles like the Rock. Up front you go through the crew quarters, and while you can easily fly this ship solo, it's a neat way to have four dedicated beds for the crew. So if in the future you're looking for something to get a group of mates around in, it could definitely be a good shout. And in the cockpit you've also got four seats, so unlike in the Cutlass where your extra friends would be sitting in the back with nothing to see, everybody gets to look out the window here. But unfortunately you do also have to contend with probably the worst visibility out of any ships in this list with the Freelancer's huge dashboard blocking any downward line of sight. Maneuverability is the same as the Cutlass in terms of pitch, yaw and roll, but speeds are a bit lower, with SCM of 154 and max speed of 1005. You also lose out on the VTOL, so it's a bit less flexible there. In this vid, I am tending to steer clear of variants, since they do tend to be just more specialised versions of the base ship. I've got a couple of exceptions and I think the Freelancer Max makes sense as one. Because I think if you can live with the Freelancer's issues in terms of mobility and visibility, then the Max's enhanced cargo hold can help to alleviate some of the issues with ground vehicle access, giving you far more room in the bank, 
and you can also fit in more boxes with 122 SCU of cargo capacity. Otherwise, it's pretty much an identical ship, although you do randomly get a slight enhancement to your speed as a little bonus. The max is a bit pricier though, and it will set you back 2.2 million credits from New Deal. The Drake Corsair takes us into the next weight class, what I tend to think about as large medium ships versus the small mediums like the Cutties and the Freelancers. It's worth noting at this point that these ships are perfectly fine to solo, but if you're watching this vid and planning for the future a bit more, then it merits keeping in mind that these ships do tend to be designed with a crew of 3 to 5 in mind. The Corsair is a very reasonably priced ship for what it offers, and you can pick one up in-game for 3.4 million credits from New Deal. The ship is something of a Marmite case. Its looks are unique and it definitely kicks off some Star Wars vibes, but I know that not everyone is taken with it. Systems wise, it's fairly decent, with a size 3 shield, two size 2 power plants, two size 2 coolers and a size 2 QT drive. But the Corsair really shines in the gun department, offering probably the most pilot controlled firepower in game out of any ship. You can mess around with the loadouts and the gimbling, but you effectively have 4 size 5, 2 size 4 and 2 size 2 weapon hardpoints at your disposal. The cargo bay packs a not unreasonable 72 SEU, but one of its key strengths is actually its shape, with quite a wide opening making loading ground vehicles or a snub fighter on board nice and easy. With a bit of precision flying, you can even fit a Pisces, meaning that if you want to you could pack a C8R rescue variant and give yourself a tier 3 med bed option. The habitation area is pretty comfortable, if a little bit drake, with a communal mess hall and separate bedrooms for each of the crew. And then you have an elevator access point that can not only take you down to the ground, but also up onto the roof of the vehicle, which I think is just a really cool feature. I love a lot of the interactable features on this ship, and it does really show that it's one of the newer models. The turrets are next on the way to the front of the ship, and we've got one of these on each side, they can add a further two size 2 guns to the Corsair's firepower, but it's worth noting that the field of fire is pretty terrible, and you won't be getting them onto the same target as the pilot unless it's a giant. Up front we've got the cockpit, which leans heavily on the cutlass, although this time the co-pilot slides underneath the pilot as opposed to going above. Of course there's a trade-off, though with most ships of this weight class, Maneuverability leaves quite a lot to be desired, with 27 max pitch and roll and 85 yaw making it one of the clunkier ships on this list. SCM speed of 150 and max speed of 950 also make it the second most sluggish. The title of most sluggish though sadly belongs to the next ship on our list, the Constellation Andromeda from RSI. But don't let that put you off, it's got a lot else going for it. The base Connie will set you back 3.5 million, and it's one of the stalwarts of the game with the concept dating back to the Kickstarter. And if like me, you've already accumulated some star sets and nostalgia along the way, then it's firmly rooted as one of the first multi-crew ships. It's not a slouch in terms of components either, with the same setup in terms of systems as the Corsair. And while its stock loadout of 4 gimbaled size 4 weapons isn't as punchy, they are still pretty good, and you can upsize two of them to fix size 5s if you want. You also do have the benefit of well positioned turrets, allowing two friends to cover the top and bottom of the ship with 360 degrees of fire, allowing you to bring four extra size 2s to bear on your target quite easily. But where the Andromeda really excels is in missile payload, with a massive 12 size 2s and 28 size 1s. The Connies all have two entrances when landed, one crew elevator and the other through the cargo bay. And then like the Corsair, they've got two airlocks as well, once you're in space. At the top of the crew elevator, you'll find a basic hab area with seating, kitchen, crew bunks and weapons racks. And to be honest, particularly when putting it straight after the Corsair, a lot of this does start to look quite dated, and I can't help but think that with a rework CIG would make way better use of the available space. Checking out the back first, we've got the cargo bay, which is plenty big enough for a couple of ground vehicles, and can also carry 96 SCU of cargo. Then if we carry on through to the back, past the engineering bay, you can access the Connie's dedicated snub fighter, a P-52 Merlin. The constellations are fairly unique in this regard, and off the top of my head I can't think of any other ship with an integrated snub like this. 
So taken in combination with the turrets, the Merlin can really help mitigate the poor manoeuvrability of the Connie, meaning that if you have a full crew, it can dish out plenty of DPS. Back at the front, we've got the bridge, which, while it gets a lot of stick for poor visibility, is still in my opinion one of the best feeling in the game. There's something about being in one of these with a bunch of mates that's just really awesome. However, the somewhat poor view can make cruising through an asteroid field a little bit dangerous. And yes, as mentioned, with max pitch and roll of 25 and max yaw of 65, combined with an SCM speed of 144 and max speed of 911, you are very much driving a boat. Still, sometimes it's about enjoying the ride. So again, I'm not diving into variants that much, but the Connie Taurus is two of two. It's a very similar ship to the Andromeda, so not a great deal needs to be added here. But what you do get is a decent pickup in cargo space, with 174 SCU versus the Andromeda's 96. And for additional utility points, the bottom turret is replaced by a really useful tractor beam. I know a lot of folks over on our Discord have been really happy using a Taurus to run bounty hunting salvage, since the tractor beam turret allows them to position the ship and loot the cargo straight into their own hold without leaving the bridge. On the downside, you are giving up some firepower from that turret, and the snub in exchange for the extra cargo space. But this is unlikely to matter if you're mostly soloing or you're just operating with one or two friends. It's also a smidge cheaper at 3.3 million credits. Now for these last two, we are admittedly going to take a bit of a skip and a jump in terms of price, but a lot of folks will argue that the Crusader Mercury is well worth the 4.9 million credits it will set you back. The Mercury, or MSR, is billed as a data running ship, but pending that gameplay making its way in, right now it still makes a fantastic daily driver and small scale cargo hauler. Systems wise, you are giving up a bit compared to the last few entries downsizing to two size 2 shields, but keeping the same cooler power plant and QT drive setup. It's also notably undergunned, with the pilot only controlling two size 3 weapons, with two turrets giving another two each as long as you've got the bodies to man them. But realistically, the MSR's a runner not a fighter. Inside you do get a decent package though. The cargo bay is nice and roomy, able to accommodate a good couple of ground vehicles, or 114 SCU of freight. Then up the small lift you'll find access to the servers for data running, when that makes it in, and a cool crew hab area. I really like how the hab here is kept separate from the recreation area, with the kitchen, seating and functional chess table. The chess table hides one of the MSR's quirkier features, providing an access point to the underfloor tunnel system, and this could potentially allow you to sneak up on someone boarding your ship, and they were clearly taking some influence from a certain ship in a certain popular sci-fi franchise, but honestly, I'm a little bit meh on it. It works for Han and Chewie because it's a conversion to their ship that nobody knows about. Everybody knows this is here, so I don't think that you're really going to be getting that element of surprise. I also can't help but think that a whole lot of the ship's internal space is taken up by these tunnels, and it could be potentially better used. Heading to the cockpit leads us to another of the Mercury's downsides. Doors, doors, and more doors. Uh, maybe I'm letting some subjectivity creep in here, but these drive me a little bit mad. And to be fair, the devs have gone on record as saying the ship lacks a second entry point and that that was just an oversight. But just note that we've been waiting for a while on an update for it, so really don't hold your breath on that. Still after these many, many doors, you do finally get to a sleek cockpit and it's in the handling department that the Mercury truly shines. With max pitch and roll of 30, and yaw of 125, it's only actually outperformed by the much smaller Nomad, and ironically the Freelancer Max. But it outpaces these with SCM speed of 215, and max speed of 1287. Considering your daily driver will most probably see a lot of use getting you to and from locations in orbit or on the ground, this is definitely not a factor to overlook. And finally for the official list, coming in at the borderline excessive sum of 6.4 million credits, we've got the Origin 400i. I do find it pretty funny that while Origin and Drake sit at either extreme of the luxury spectrum, they are the most likely to cause the same Marmite reaction in people. And this slimmed down space yacht really is no exception. I guess it's because the idea of luxury, which is what slaps those few extra million onto the price, isn't particularly tangible. 
For some people, I know this ship is a must-have, while for other more utilitarian pilots, it's often just completely overlooked. Systems-wise, it is a little bit of an upgrade versus others in the weight class, on account of its stated role as an exploration vessel. So as well as a size 3 shield, you get triplicates of the power plants and the coolers, allowing for a lot more contingency in the event of a breakdown. And when component wear and tear comes into the game, this could prove really important. Guns are similarly anemic to those found on the Mercury, with two size 3s for the pilot and two remote turrets giving four more size 3s between them. And whatever you make of the aesthetics, the 400i does have some cool features, including a separate vehicle bay, which can be brought down with this switch on the front leg. Which vehicles it can take is quite limiting though, having been pretty exclusively designed for the X1 hoverbike series that's just released. And also the 400i's cargo bay, which has these weird jutting spars around it, does mean that this is one of the few ships on this list which can't actually carry a rock miner. You can also use the same switch at the front leg to bring down the stair entry when planet side. I do have to say that when, when compared to the entry to other ships on the list, it definitely does feel a lot more regal. On the lower deck you've got the engineering gubbins, then the elevator will take us to the technical deck. Up here you'll find two separate bedrooms, one for the captain and a shared one for the two crew members. And towards the rear we've got a kitchen, diner, along with a really cool looking map table. Then up front we've got the bridge, which does have pretty decent visibility. And I really like how the design language across the 400i, 600i and 890 really ties together. In terms of handling though, we're back down to earth a bit after the Mercury, with max pitch and roll at 29 and yaw at 75. But meanwhile, SCM speed of 185 and max speed of 1250 mean it's actually only a little bit slower than the fastest entry. Now I did go back and forth a little bit on this last one, and I decided to make it an honourable mention. So as I said in the beginning, I really prefer to focus on what you can buy in-game, and the Crusader C1 Spirit's only currently available for cash. Still, it does really have all the hallmarks of a great daily driver, so I'm stopping short of officially including it until you can buy it for a UEC. But that being said, you might be watching this at some point in the future, and I personally reckon when it comes to it, it's going to come in for something like 2.5 to 3.5 million. And I do reckon that for that sort of in-game cash, it will be a strong contender. Particularly if you're looking at it versus something in the smaller end of the range like the Cutlass or the Freelancers. In terms of cargo, it packs 64 SEU, and it's been designed with the new different box sizes in mind to comfortably fit two of the 32 SEU crates. And this also makes for a great shape in terms of fitting ground vehicles comfortably. You can very much see the difference in terms of the newest and oldest designs on show here, and everything about the interior is just hyper efficient and ergonomic. Obviously this is partially the design language of Crusader as a manufacturer, but it's also just CIG getting better at their craft. The crew area is simple but functional, just be sure to check that there's nobody in the bathroom before showing it in a video. I actually really like that this is clearly a ship designed from the bottom up for two people, since so many folks have that one mate that they play with the most. The additional utility of the tractor beam which can be operated from the co-pilot seat is also a big draw. On paper, handling is very much in line with the Cutty and the Freelancer, with 28 pitch and roll and 117 yaw, while SCM speeds of 154 put it towards the lower end and max speed of 1120 sits towards the top. However, still with its sleek pancake profile, it does feel awesome to throw into some corners. Definitely one to keep an eye on in a future patch. So that was just my list of some of the most conventional daily drivers that you might want to consider if you haven't found your perfect one yet. But the great thing about this, and one of the best things about Star Citizen more generally, is that you do you. So I popped a message up in Discord asking our community to ping me with their daily drivers, and I got all sorts of responses from cutters to hammerheads. So really you just find what works and you gel with the most. As for me, this is my cutty. There are many like it, but this one is mine. So I pledged for SC back in 2012 with a 325A package. When I started playing properly in 2019, I upgraded to this Cutlass Black. And while I might have bought a few other ships along the way, this is one that will probably never leave my hangar. Personally, I love it for its simplicity, I love flying it, and I just don't think about the duct tape. If you enjoyed the video, then please do consider dropping a like and hitting subscribe. 
and just let me know in the comments which is your favourite daily driver. I'm going to be spending the holidays with my families, so things are likely to be a little bit less consistent, but I'm sure we'll be back to it in the new year. I do hate to end videos on a down or a serious note, but I think this is quite important to say. The holidays can be a fantastic time, but they can also be really hard for a lot of people, particularly if you don't have anyone to spend them with. So we just celebrated three years of the Frontier community on Discord. It's honestly one of the best things I've been involved with creating. So regardless of where you are in the world, if you want to find folks to hang out with, then at nearly any time of day, there's going to be someone in a voice channel to hop in with. Even if just like me, you're only popping in to escape your in-laws for an hour or two. So please do feel free to swing by, the Discord link's just down in the video description below. But with all that said, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end, and I look forward to seeing you next time.